Ethical Leadership by Jay Salzberg Expect the Unexpected This presentation is a no-nonsense attempt to educate and inform. Many aspects of this presentation are agreeable, but most people may find it objectionable. This is Dr. Freud's couch. You may make an appointment with Dr. Freud after this presentation. <laughs> Definition of a leader. One who guides or shows the way. A leader is not one who tells or forces the way. Effective leadership is the ability to create, share, and engage people in a vision of the future. Organizations need effective leaders to endure and survive. But what does it mean to be an effective leader? Even those who have served in various leadership roles may find it difficult explaining it to someone else. Perhaps because we are always unsure of our own abilities in those roles. It is particularly difficult to define in terms of an all-volunteer organization in which members are associated because of their sharing a common hobby or social activity. In every different situation or organization, different styles of leadership may apply. Ethical Leadership, Part 1 of 3 Leadership that is directed by respect for ethical beliefs and values and for the dignity and rights of others. It is thus related to concepts such as trust, honesty, consideration, charisma, and fairness. Ethical Leadership, Part 2 of 3 Ethics is concerned with the kinds of values and morals an individual or society finds desirable or appropriate. Ethical Leadership, Part 3 of 3 Ethics is concerned with the virtuousness of individuals and their motives. A leader's choices are also influenced by his or her moral development. Many of us who have been in a leadership position have wished for a world-class ability to command. However, a leader must have a vision for the organization and be able to articulate without bias that vision to others in such a way that others want to share and be a part of that vision. That is the guiding part. The fun part. Leadership is teamwork, not dictatorship. The best way to learn is to try. Be willing to share what you learn with others and encourage others to share their ideas with you. That way, everyone in the organization can benefit from a stronger and ethical society. Characteristics of Effective Leadership A well-defined sense of purpose A knowledge of your strengths and weaknesses And a willingness to admit both Desire to learn new skills and facts The ability to establish strong human relationships Be willing to be guided by the needs of those you serve. Have a persistent effort to produce results. Possess the ability to transform mistakes into learning situations. And have the ability to unite people into a common effort. Leaders and Enchantment Enchantment is the process 
of delighting people with a product, service, organization, or idea. Enchantment produces voluntary and long-lasting support, unless the group is corrupt. The need for enchantment means you're doing something meaningful. Enchantment is not possible unless everyone is liked on both sides of the conference table. Leaders and the led must be mutually liked. Enchantment works only if all those in the group trust each other. Crap is not enchanting. Acts of crap elimination always works to enchant. Social proof reduces friction of change. Ways to get everyone to agree to change is enchantment itself. For enchantment to endure, the group must internalize the process of enchantment through commitment. Discussion is enchanting. Debate is intimidation. Winning an argument is not winning. The Ship of State It is difficult to lead if you do not know where you are going. It is also difficult to lead if you do not know to whom you are leading. You know, members and potential members. You know the members are interested in the purpose of the organization. You may know many of the members' specific interests, but you may not know why they decided to join the organization or what they expect of you as a leader. Generally, the members break down into four main categories. Categories of Members, Part 1 of 4 Those who want to do something. These are the activists, from school-aged politicians who held a class office, who want to do more of the same, to seasoned professionals. They may have great enthusiasm for a current project and want to share that enthusiasm with the group. They may have a desire to help others and feel they can channel that desire through their experience, skill set, or hobby. This group is often the easiest from which to draw officers. It gives them something to do. Categories of Members, Part 2 of 4 Those who want to learn something. Your organization may be one based on a technical skill like computer operations, amateur radio, amateur astronomy, or community development. Many of its participants may not be technically trained. They join the organization from a basic fascination with your organization's purpose and seek broader information and experience. Association with others having a similar interest allows them to test their understanding in a non-threatening way. Categories of Members, Part 3 of 4 Those who want to be part of something who draw personal energy from association with others and may use their interest in your organization to discover new associations. Some people are just natural joiners. Others may see your group having a good time and want to have one also. Categories of Members, Part 4 of 4 Those who are curious they may have seen your booth at a trade show or convention or your YouTube presentations. Then there is the Internet. They may have bought a computer, ham radio, or telescope and want to know what to do with it. They have joined your organization to see what it is all about. 
and they may or may not say. As the leader of the organization, you need to address the needs of all members equally. Perhaps you can not address all at the same time, but you must be mindful of their various needs so that one group is not addressed at the expense of another. If you do so effectively, members will tend to move up in the four categories. Leadership Positions The elected leaders of any organization are usually the officers. Officer titles and their job functions are most often defined in the organization's bylaws, constitution, operating rules, or other defining document. The position of the officers are defined in typical bylaws describing the duties and guidelines upon which duties of officers might be based. Depending on the bylaws, the organization must split its governing body in two. Typically, when a tipping point number of members is exceeded, say 25, the organization should expand from two groups into three groups. They are, number one, the members, no elected officers or board members in the membership, elected officers, that is, from the membership, by the members, and the board of directors, usually appointed by the elected officers and voted on by the members, and an odd number, 357, etc. Why split the governing body in two, you say? When an organization is small, the number of members is small, they have small assets, and the group is club-like, Decisions over its activities and the disposition of assets may be handled by the elected officers, with the exception of purchases over a fixed amount determined in the bylaws, expenses and donations typically $25 overall, both financial and material, which must be voted on by a majority plus one, the quorum, of the members. Ethics dictates elected officers are not allowed to vote in such matters and certainly are not allowed to decide the disposition of such matters. The elected officers administrate and will of the members by deciding when and what is to be voted on by the membership, not the disposition of the assets. Any breach of this confidence or denial of access to assets of the members by the officers is an ethics violation and may even be illegal. Disposition of assets are defined by the bylaws. Small organizations are flexible. Many decisions may be handled by the officers. However, as the organization grows both in membership and assets, the rules must become more restrictive on the officers. There comes a point when a board of directors must be commissioned. Ethics dictates the organization transform into more of a business. Again, why split the governing positions in two? To maintain ethical governing, that is why. The new board of directors are elected by and from the members, but the presiding elected officers initially only vote to choose who is the chairman of the board from the pool elected by the members. You know, defined by the bylaws, again, this may be quite flexible in smaller organizations. At the commission of the first board, officers lose the responsibility of voting over decisions of the organization even as members. The elected officers transform to deciding and drafting what is to be voted on by the board. The board votes on decisions 
chosen by the elected officers. The officers do not vote. However, the elected officers preside over the board agenda and maintain decorum in the board meetings. The board may meet separately from the elected officers to discuss issues, deciding who is to be the next chairman, but may not vote on matters of the organization. The elected officers must be present for and record the vote of the board, reporting the results to the membership in a timely manner. All this may sound awkward, but it's required to maintain ethics by default in a large organization governed by the organization's rules of order and its bylaws. The main purpose of these rules of order is to prevent the formation of a cult of personality in the organization, all too often an affliction. Elected officers are responsible for reporting the board's vote to the membership in a timely and formal manner, again delineated by the bylaws. All meetings of the officers and the board, where votes are cast, must be accessible to the public, scheduled, and orderly, governed by the bylaws. Typically, there is an election for officers and board members once a year. The board rotates chairman every three months. Leadership The remaining portion of this presentation may be viewed by some as negative. However, it is not negative to point out negative aspects of the human condition that adversely affect the health and welfare of individuals and organizations. It is healthy and productive. Some may also ask why these negative observations are included here. This is to sensitize those interested in learning more about ethics and ethical leadership to the behavior that is so egregious, unethical leadership. Leadership as a threat. It is natural for people to follow a leader who seems to be in charge, even if that leader is incompetent or unethical. Members of organizations just do not want to rock the boat and want to feel and be accepted. However, term limits are a means to keep an organization vital, vibrant, and protected from ethics violations. If an individual becomes entrenched as a leader who devolves into a leader who steers the organization into a rut, it is imperative to have rules of order in the bylaws to limit the term and re-electability of elected officers. More often than not, organization leaders get stuck. That's a cognitive bias. In an errant idea, Thinking and proclaiming, this is what our organization is or is not about. Without well-crafted rules of order, the corruption known as cult of personality may take hold. Savvy members and the public may detect this unwanted behavior, which may doom the organization. Many leaders would rather destroy the organization than entertain anything that threatens their leadership or their imaginary or delusional idea of what the organization is all about. Then there is the invisible agenda, an organization maintained by an entity, foundation, or institution outside the organization. This may be identified by a lack of formal rules of order, no bylaws, or destructive decisions regarding the bylaws. 
Just plain indecent. Such organizations are unethical by default. Organizations in schools and on government property, like parks, schools, university, military reservations, are an example, sometimes causing bad feelings and friction from students or members with the administrators and parents. Cult of Personality Leadership Fiascos Stalin was the leader about whom the expression cult of personality was devised in 1956 by Nikita Khrushchev. The Soviet Republic under Stalin was responsible for tens of millions of its people dying horribly either in prison camps or by being disappeared. Yet the people adored Stalin, and many of them still do. A cult of personality, COP for short, not to be confused with a personality cult, like Trumpists, for example, may be a group or organization and may not be limited to just a single leader. COPs use various techniques, including mass media, like TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, and postal letters, the Internet, you know, the web, social media, Facebook, email, blah, 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 propaganda, like hit pieces, smear campaigns, and doxing, the arts, music, stage, screen, patriotism, you know, flag-waving, and government-organized, supported, and permitted demonstrations, like rallies, festivals, street fairs, parades, and outdoor events, to create a heroic or community-oriented image of a leader or organization, even a mythical hero, often inviting worship behavior through uncritical flattery and praise. Cult-like activities are not limited to adoration of a person. It can be of an institution, a historical monument, an edifice, artwork, sacred grounds, or natural resources. A COP may rise from small organization whenever there is the opportunity to present itself. Humans have a weakness of being attracted to celebrity and charismatic personalities. Then there are the promises, privileges, and favors that a COP may tout to attract members and philanthropists. These promises and plans may be real, unobtainable, or imaginary, even delusional, to maintain the cult's hold on its members, its community, and especially philanthropists. COPs may hide or obscure their plans to make their cult appear mysterious. Schemes, false promises, and exaggerated claims may be concocted, then revealed to relieve members of their time, labor, money, and possessions for the purpose of uncovering the secret plans of the cult to the contributing member and philanthropist. Some COPs intentionally hide their plans or have none, an obvious deception, even if they have something to show. Plans are not evidence of honesty. Then there is that thing everyone has heard. Quote, if we only had a few hundred thousand or million dollars more, we will be able to blah, 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 blah. This is a red flag warning for all concerned to inquire into the organization's motives, rationality, and planning. Skepticism is healthy and may protect you and the community from harm. All too often, COPs have absconded.
That's another word for stolen. With funds, with little to show for the contributions given them, him or her. Conflicts of interest. A situation in which a person, like a leader or officer of the organization, is in a position to derive personal benefit from actions or decisions made in their official capacity. Everyone has heard of this unethical activity. The awful truth of this unethical activity is that some may consider this as the usual way to conduct business. Entire nations are organized on maintaining conflicts of interest. Leaders may pad invoices or hire and pay their relations, family, and friends from the treasury of the organization. Conflicts of interest may appear legitimate. They are not. It is unethical and sometimes illegal for it even to be discussed, much less committed. Ethical organizations avoid even the appearance of conflicts of interest, whether they are real or not. Bias We all have our biases. It is a set of assumptions that we make, and the things we may not notice about people's race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, appearance, or other traits. They come from the part of our mind that jumps to conclusions that we may not even be aware that we have. Bias gets in the way of good collaboration, performance, and decision-making. Bias is not inevitable and may be overcome in three steps, that is, for organizations. Step one, create a shared vocabulary, like, you know, in the agenda before the meeting. Bias shows up as big, embarrassing gaps in dialogue or discussions. You know, those awkward silences after someone says something? In meetings, often meaning goes unnoticed. Worse, people don't know what to say. Post a shared list of words and phrases for the meeting in advance so everyone attending knows what to expect. Step 2. Create a norm for how to respond when the bias is pointed out, like literally waving a purple flag or some other agreed-upon signal. When your bias is pointed out, be glad to learn something new and move past the shame. If in the meeting it is perceived that harm has been done, shame may be overcome by pointing out the norm and not the bias. Say, thank you for pointing that out, or I get it, or I don't get it. Could you explain more after the meeting? Create an environment in the meetings where biases can be overcome. They will become less threatening. Patience and persistence will help overcome biases. Step three, commit to regularly disrupting biases, at least once in every meeting. Being silent about bias reinforces it. Leaders must speak up. Being silent about bias allows it to metastasize into something worse, like prejudice, bullying, and discrimination, or harassment. Cognitive bias is a systematic pattern of deviation from normal or rational judgment. 
individuals create their own subjective social reality from their perceptions. An individual's construction of social reality, not the objective inputs to perception, may dictate their behavior in the social world. Unethical Bias Behavioral ethics is a new field of social scientific research, about 70 years old, that seeks to understand how people actually behave when confronted with ethical dilemmas. It refers to behavior that is judged according to generally accepted norms of behavior. Bias to misbehave when confronted with ethical decisions, whether conscious or unconscious, is characterized by rationalizing decisions which negatively impact others materially, socially, or psychologically. Unethical behavior may come from ignorance, wrong thinking, greed, dishonesty, egocentrism, narcissism, prejudice, and delusion, among many other human weaknesses. Unethical Bias and the Dunning-Kruger Effect The most resilient parasite is an idea. Once the parasitic idea takes hold of the organization, it is almost impossible to eradicate. Very often, leaders suffer from identity of authority. Where they make their mistake, a gap between their elected authority and the actual proven authenticity. There is huge power in authenticity. Faults creep in when one believes in their own authenticity without having the experience of other leaders as a model. Very little, if any, truly original thoughts are in play in the decisions governing an organization. To achieve true authenticity in leadership, leaders should depend on judgment and consensus of their peers, let alone the history of how other organizations have made good and bad decisions. What is in the mind of the leader is often not authentic. The Cognitive Bias of the Dunning-Kruger Effect By overestimating one's own ability to make ethical decisions, acting on one's own authority or experience is all that a leader has in making decisions when there is little time to research an authentic source of reliable experience. A decision may feel normal, but may suffer ethically. It is important for leaders to know the facts, the rules of order, and how others have handled similar situations. Leaders' decisions over an organization may not sit well with everyone in the organization. A leader must know that one's own authenticity may be incompatible with a morality that values all persons and must be prepared to discuss, not debate, the moral, ethical, religious, etc. issues of a proposed decision with the members in the organization's meetings. Cognitive biases that adversely affect ethical decisions and behavior. Confirmation bias. This is the most prevalent cognitive bias in community organizations. It's the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms one's pre-existing beliefs or hypotheses. 
Reactive devaluation. A cognitive bias that occurs when a proposal is devalued if it appears to originate from an antagonist. Not invented here. An unwillingness to adopt an idea or product because it originates from another culture, a form of tribalism. Selective perception. The tendency not to notice and quickly forget stimuli that cause emotional discomfort and contradict prior beliefs. Semmelweis reflex. The reflex-like tendency to reject new evidence or new knowledge because it contradicts established norms, beliefs, or paradigms. Bias blind spot. The cognitive bias of recognizing the impact of bias on the judgment of others while failing to see the impact of bias on one's own judgment. Naive cynicism. The cognitive bias and form of psychological egoism that occurs when people naively expect more egocentric bias in others than actually is the case. Naive realism. The human tendency to believe that we see the world around us objectively and that people who disagree with us must be uninformed, irrational, or biased. Authority bias. The tendency to attribute greater accuracy to the opinion of an authority figure, unrelated to its content, and be more influenced by that opinion. That's the expert from afar bias, or bias against experts nearby. Normalcy bias. A belief that causes people to underestimate both the possibility of a disaster, threat, or unsafe condition, and its possible effects because it causes people to have a bias that things will always function the way things normally function. People with normalcy bias have difficulty reacting to something that they have not experienced before. They also tend to interpret warnings in the most optimistic way possible, seizing on the ambiguities to infer a less serious situation, a desire for or to maintain the status quo. Curse of Knowledge A cognitive bias that occurs when an individual communicating with others unknowingly assumes that the others have the background to understand. False consensus bias. People tend to overestimate the extent to which their opinions, beliefs, preferences, values, and habits are normal and typical of others, that others also think the same way they do. This bias leads to the perception of a consensus that does not exist, a false consensus. Personality Disorders What are personality disorders? This part of the presentation may be difficult for some to accept, but it is important, providing understanding of where certain unwanted behaviors originate. These disorders are primordial and have existed in the human condition for millions of years. Personality is the way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that makes a person different from other people. An individual's personality is influenced by experiences, environment, like surroundings and life situations, 
and inherited characteristics. A person's personality typically stays the same over time. A personality disorder is a way of thinking, feeling, and behaving that deviates from the expectations of the culture, causes distress or problems functioning, and lasts over time. There are ten specific types of personality disorders. Personality disorders are long-term patterns of behavior and inner experiences that differ significantly from what is expected. The pattern of experience and behavior begins by late adolescence or early adulthood and causes distress or problems in functioning. Without treatment, personality disorders can be long-lasting. Personality disorders affect at least two of these areas, way of thinking about oneself and others, way of responding emotionally, way of relating to other people, and way of controlling one's behavior. What are the 10 specific personality disorders? Unfortunately, PDs are prevalent and may be amplified by social groups, exhibiting behavior ranging from imparting discomfort to destructive, even criminal, behavior. Number one, antisocial personality disorder, a pattern of disregarding or violating the rights of others. A person with antisocial personality disorder may not conform to social norms, may repeatedly lie or deceive others, or may act impulsively. Avoidant personality disorder. A pattern of extreme shyness, feelings of inadequacy, and extreme sensitivity to criticism. People with avoidant personality disorder may be unwilling to get involved with people unless they are certain of being liked, be preoccupied with being criticized or rejected, or may view themselves as not being good enough or socially inept. Borderline Personality Disorder A pattern of instability in personal relationships intense emotions, poor self-image, and impulsivity. A person with borderline personality disorder may go to great lengths to avoid being abandoned, have repeated suicide attempts, display inappropriate intense anger, or have ongoing feelings of emptiness. Dependent Personality Disorder a pattern of needing to be taken care of, and submissive and clinging behavior. People with dependent personality disorder may have difficulty making daily decisions without reassurance from others or may feel uncomfortable or helpless when alone because of fear of inability to take care of themselves. Histrionic Personality Disorder a pattern of excessive emotion and attention-seeking. People with histrionic personality disorder may be uncomfortable when they are not the center of attention, may use physical appearance to draw attention to themselves, or have rapidly shifting or exaggerated emotions. Narcissistic Personality Disorder a pattern of need for admiration and lack of empathy for others. A person with narcissistic personality disorder may have a grandiose sense of self-importance, a sense of entitlement, take advantage of others, or lack empathy. Obsessive-compulsive personality disorder a pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfection, and control. 
A person with obsessive compulsive personality disorder may be overly focused on details or schedules, may work excessively, not allowing time for leisure or friends, or may be inflexible in their morality and values. This is not the same as obsessive compulsive disorder. Paranoid personality disorder. A pattern of being suspicious of others and seeing them as mean or spiteful. People with paranoid personality disorder often assume people will harm or deceive them and don't confide in others or become close to them. Schizoid personality disorder. Being detached from social relationships and expressing little emotion. A person with schizoid personality disorder typically does not seek close relationships, chooses to be alone, and seems to not care about praise or criticism from others. Schizotypal personality disorder. A pattern of being very uncomfortable in close relationships, having distorted thinking, and eccentric behavior. A person with schizotypal personality disorder may have odd beliefs or odd or peculiar behavior or speech or may have excessive social anxiety. Number 11 on our list of 10 personality disorders is the malignant narcissist. Malignant narcissism Last but certainly not least, the worst psychological syndrome, otherwise known as psychosis, of all those with toxic personality disorders, exhibiting unethical leadership, often rearing its ugly head in groups and organizations, comprises an extreme mix of narcissism, antisocial behavior, aggression, screwball decision-making, absurd sardonic wit, and even sadism characterized by grandiosity and the desire to raise hostility levels, undermining organizations in which the narcissist may lead or are involved, dehumanizing the people with whom they associate and deliberately damaging people in pursuit of their own selfish desires. Leadership attracts narcissists. Be aware the malignant narcissist may seem nice, even for long periods, but they are putting on an act and may consciously or unconsciously bring down members and the organization. The malignant narcissist will spend however much time it takes to influence others in the organization to pick sides for the purpose of expelling those in the organization who are aware of their malignant personality, usually by obtaining power and control of decision-making and the organization's money and assets. Serial malignant narcissists male or female, are typically very high achievers, usually having a history of victims and crimes in their past, and may have relocated many times to quench their thirst for more and more victims and to avoid retribution.